Good evening and welcome to March and welcome to our severe weather special. We got the whole weather team here over the next half hour. We're going to talk about the different types of severe weather that can affect us here in East Tennessee and Southeast Kentucky. And of course, we'll help get you prepared for some of the upcoming spring severe weather season. All right, well, let's get started with flooding. We often have flooding when we receive heavy rain, which can lead to issues on the roads and can cause rivers, creeks and streams to rise. Absolutely. Cassie Nall spoke to the Tennessee Valley Authority about why this happens and what they do to mitigate flooding here in East Tennessee. I'm here at TVA with James Everett. He is the River Forecast Center manager. And let's start by talking a little bit about why East Tennessee is so susceptible to flooding. Yeah, so you think about the valley, the Tennessee Valley, we get a lot of rainfall here. We get on average 52 inches of rain, and that's, that's a lot. Uh, a lot of that rainfall occurs in the winter months when vegetation is dormant, the ground is wet, and so that heavy rainfall in the winter makes a lot of runoff. Um, and then the other thing going on here in East Tennessee is the terrain. We have the Great Smoky Mountains. We have a lot of terrain around here. And so as that rainfall and runoff comes down through the mountains, it uh, can be intense at times. And that's where TVA comes in, obviously, managing the, some of the rivers, some of the lakes here. Tell us a little bit about how you guys mitigate flooding. Yeah, so TVA, we flood control is one of our original original objectives. Think about the TVA Act of 1933. We're charged with managing the Tennessee River uh, for a lot of benefits, but one of those is flood control. So a series of dams, we operate 49 dams in seven different states, and we control a drainage area of about 40,000 square miles. So all these river systems come together, these tributaries feed into the main stem Tennessee River. So we use lakes and the tributaries to store water during these, these big flood events, and then dams along the main stem Tennessee River were oftentimes opening floodgates and passing that flow downstream, areas like Knoxville, Chattanooga, Huntsville through North Alabama, and even regulating flooding on the Ohio River near Paducah, Kentucky. So speaking of regulating the water levels, a lot of folks want to know, why do you lower the water levels in the winter and then raise them in the summer? Yeah, so it's all about flood control. If uh, you think about the rainfall patterns that we get, we get about 60% of our runoff between January and say early April. So we're right in the heart of our heavy runoff period where the, the ground is wet, uh, vegetation's dormant, it's cool outside. And so when we get these rain events, we get a lot, a lot of runoff from that. And that's why we want these lakes lowered in the winter months so we can uh, store that water and reduce flooding downstream. And in the summer, you raise them up because they can keep that type of water in there and also for recreation purposes. That's right. As we get closer and closer to the spring and summer months, we'll be looking to fill these lakes back up and, uh, and enjoy our recreation season. Now, TVA also says that they average about $300 million per year in estimated damages averted because of their flood mitigation efforts. And during the flooding of February 2019, that number jumped to $1.6 billion. That is crazy. But here's the deal. TVA doesn't manage all of the rivers and lakes in East Tennessee and Southeast Kentucky, which is why it's important for you to respect the power of water. Listen to this. Just six inches of fast moving water can knock an adult off their feet. Just six inches. A foot of water can sweep away a car and 18 to 24 inches of rushing water can even push an SUV, a truck, a van all off the road. That is amazing. And according to the CDC, more deaths occur from flooding than any other thunderstorm related hazard. And over half of all flood re related drownings occur when a vehicle is driven into hazardous floodwaters. And that's why we say turn around, don't drown. Never drive through floodwaters, even if you've driven the same road a million times. You just never know uh, how fast that water could be moving or how deep it is or if the road under it has been compromised. And of course, it's important to remember that if you choose to put your own safety at risk and end up in a bad situation, you could also put the lives of the folks who come to rescue you at risk. It's always the right decision. Just don't drive through the floodwaters. All right, we do get a lot of rain each year here in East Tennessee and Southeast Kentucky. I recently spoke to Anthony Cavallucci with the National Weather Service in Morristown about our recent heavy rain and flooding and why it's important to be ready this severe weather season. Last week, we're talking about a ton of rainfall in a very short period of time, and the soil just can't absorb all that right now. The vegetation is, is really not alive. We don't have to feed those, those leaves and the grass. So the trees aren't really taking it in either right now, which also leads to some of that heavy, heavy uh, runoff that you speak of. Yes, Anthony, looking back to last week, the heavy rain, the flooding, my oh my, how quickly things can change in East Tennessee. And that's a reminder for all of us, right? We had a dry period for part of February, and just like that, it changed. And we went from dry and fire danger to 
Heavy rain and flooding. Another humble reminder of how quickly the weather can change in East Tennessee, I guess, huh? Yeah, and it's also a good reminder for people that really need to start paying attention because as more severe weather um, occurs between now and May, we need to review our safety rules for what are we going to do if a tornado warning is issued, uh, what's the family going to do in a severe thunderstorm warning, uh, things like that are really important. So I'm happy to see and, and help you guys get the word out about this to, to your viewers. And thanks to Anthony. In our conversation, we also discussed how the weather pattern has been particularly favorable for flooding during the month of February in recent years. In fact, three of the last four Februarys have been at the top 10 wettest on record. Three of the last four, including this year, which ended up in eighth place. Thankfully, we finally had a chance to dry out this week <laughs> and we're all enjoying it. Yes. And some sunshine and warmer weather, which is so nice. Yeah. Right. All right, so we are just beginning to enter the spring severe weather season. And besides flooding from torrential rain, Thunderstorms can also produce damaging wind, lightning, hail, and even tornadoes. But what exactly makes a thunderstorm severe? Well, the answer to that is that a thunderstorm is considered to be severe when it produces wind gusts of 58 miles per hour or greater and or produces hail of one inch in diameter or larger, which is about the size of a quarter. Of course, in East Tennessee, though, we've had hail much larger than just coins. Mm, we're going to hear more about that coming up after the break. We're going to take a look back at some of the damage caused by large hail in April of 2011. April 2011. Mike, you remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Plus, when thunder roars, head indoors. Lightning safety is super important heading into spring and the summer months. We'll have much more on our severe weather special when we come back. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Sure hope you're having a great night. Thanks for sticking with us. Let's go ahead and talk about hail right now, how it forms and what creates severe hail, i.e. a severe thunderstorm, has everything to do with the updraft strength of the thunderstorm. That's what pushes that air all the way up into the top of that thunderstorm, that big old towering cumulonimbus cloud. The stronger the updraft strength, the more that hail can stay suspended longer above that freezing level, meaning the larger that hail becomes until finally gravity takes a hold of it, drops it out of the sky and produces hail. So hail can run from pea size all the way up to grapefruit size, but severe hail, i.e. a severe thunderstorm warning would be issued by the National Weather Service as hail was one inch in diameter or the size of a quarter or larger. Take a look at this video. So back in 2011, remember those days? Severe hail moved its way through East Tennessee, causing massive destruction around town. All right, now let's go ahead and send things over to Rebecca Sweet and talk about lightning safety. Rebecca. Lightning strikes the United States roughly 25 million times a year. And while most people think that lightning happens just in the summer, it can happen at any time of the year. You've probably heard the saying when thunder roars head indoors. The reason why we say that is because if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. In fact, lightning often travels up to three miles from the center of the storm. And in some storms, it can travel up to 10 to 15 miles from the center of the storm. Lightning is also harder to see during the day. So what can you do? If you're outside, the only completely safe place is to seek shelter in a building or in a car. Avoid open fields and spread out from other people. Also avoid water and metal fences. Stay tuned for updates as we enter into severe weather season. Welcome back to our severe weather special. None of that in the forecast right now, though. A beautiful spring like day, a gorgeous view from our Gatlinburg camera. Still a lot of brown out there, but you know it's about to green up soon. And speaking of that, you know what comes with spring allergies. Here's our <laughs> here's our latest. Bless you, Mike. Here's our latest <laughs> pollen report. Tree pollen is moderate levels. Mold is still low at this point. And of course, looking ahead, if you like the spring like weather, we've got more on the way with temperatures in the 70s for the next five days. Some good news there. Very good news. Thanks for that update, Cassie. And just to add something that Becca mentioned and the information about lightning, there's actually no such thing <gasps> as heat lightning. Some people at home just went Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, many of us, of course, grew up being told that lightning flashing off in the distance during the summer season is caused by intense heat from the hot afternoons. I definitely was. Well, that flashing is actually just distant storms that are too far away for you to hear the thunder. 
So there you go. If you take nothing else away from this special, <laughs> yeah. there's no such thing as heat lightning. That's exactly <laughs> right. All right, so we've all talked about how thunderstorms are dangerous because of the lightning associated with them and the hell that they can produce. But you know what? Most of the damage that we see from severe storms in East Tennessee and Southeast Kentucky is actually caused by strong wind gusts. In this part of the country, with our big, beautiful, and bushy trees, it doesn't take much to knock some of those limbs down. And that's why it's a good idea to trim back those trees that are close to your home and remove dead branches before they end up doing some damage. 40 to 50 mile per hour wind gusts can cause minor power outages around here. And that doesn't even meet the criteria for a severe thunderstorm warning to be issued. Severe thunderstorms can produce winds as high as 80 to 90 miles per hour, which is the same as an EF0 and an EF1 tornado. That's why you need to take severe thunderstorm warnings seriously, just as you would with tornado warning. All right, and speaking of tornadoes, well, we get those too, right? So many of us grew up learning about Tornado Alley in the Central Plains. That includes states like Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. However, we have our own version of Tornado, tornado Alley right here in the southeastern U.S. In fact, today marks the 10-year anniversary of the March 2nd, 2012 tornado outbreak in the southeast. There, there were 12, uh, 12 confirmed tornadoes right here in East Tennessee, two in Knox County that day, and 44 people were injured. Now, spring is the most common time of year for tornadoes in East Tennessee, with March, April, and May accounting for 73% of our tornadoes by month. Yes, April 2011 does sway those numbers slightly, but even when you remove that year from the totals, April is still the month with the most tornadoes in the record books. And we do have a secondary severe weather season in the fall when cold fronts come sweeping through our region. But it's important to note that we can have tornadoes in any month in all months of the year. The most common time of day for tornadoes in East Tennessee is from 4 to 9 p.m. But considering that sunset is between 745 and 845 during the peak of the spring severe weather season, this chart shows that many tornadoes also occur after dark. That's true. All right, now let's talk about the strength of tornadoes. The intensity of tornado is rated using an enhanced Fujita scale or the EF scale. You hear about us talking about that. Uh, this actually estimates and measures the wind speeds based on damage caused by the tornado. National Weather Service actually goes out and surveys the damage. An EF zero is the weakest and a rare EF five is the strongest with winds over 200 miles per hour. As you can see from the chart, well, we don't have that right there, but uh, <laughs> there has never been an EF five recorded in East Tennessee and only one in yeah. all of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So they are very rare here. Yeah. So important to note that most homes in Tennessee are built to withstand EF zero and most EF one tornadoes. 92% of the tornadoes that we have in East Tennessee are EF two or lower, meaning that you have a good chance of surviving one of these twisters if you take action when that warning is issued and you go to your safe place. That's exactly right. The best time to figure out where that safe place is in your house is right now. Make a plan before the storms come and practice that plan with your family so that everybody knows what to do when the time comes to put that plan into action. Your safe place should be in the lowest level of the building, away from doors and windows. The goal is to put as many walls between you and the wind as possible. A basement is best, but if you don't have one, a downstairs closet, bathroom, or interior hallway will work. Have pillows and blankets to cover your head and stay in that safe place until the storm has passed. All right, so besides knowing where to go when you're at home, it's also important to know exactly where you should go when you're at your work or the place of work. All right, so that's uh, f that's for your kids and to know where the safe place is at school as well. And they practice uh, tornado yeah. drills at school. So right. have your kids memorize the uh, the phone numbers of family members or uh, reliable, let's see, I can't read that, reliable friends <laughs> that can be uh, the points of contact in an emergency. And again, do this now, practice before the storms come. And exactly. I think it's important to memorize those phone numbers because so many of us just look our contacts up oh. on the phones these days. Yep. yep. Got to memorize that phone <laughs> number just in case you don't have your cell phone. And it should be noted that there's no safe place in a mobile home. And I know that's tough for some people to hear. They just aren't built and or anchored properly to withstand the powerful winds of a tornado. Yeah, and if you live in a mobile home and a tornado watch is issued for your county, your city, it's recommended that you go stay with a friend or family member until the threat passes. If that is not an option, know where the closest sturdy building is located and be prepared to move there when the storms begin to approach your area.
Great news to know. And speaking of knowing where your storms, uh, when the storms are approaching, you need to know what county you live in and be able to yeah. find yourself on a map. We get questions about this all, <laughs> all the, time. the time. All the time. <laughs> we have a lot of folks that recently moved to East Tennessee, and part of preparing for severe weather season is not only being able to find your location when looking at a radar, but also knowing the names of the counties that surround yours. All right, so for example, if storms are in Anderson County and they're moving in from the southeast, folks in Knox County would be uh, need to know that they need to pay attention. So on the other hand, folks in Scott County and Campbell counties would also be able to know uh, that the storms are moving away from them. And we tell you that when we're on, we're like, okay, you're safe now if you're living in this county. Right. Yeah, it's important to be able to find yourself on that map and also to know the difference between a watch and a warning. <laughs> A watch means that conditions are favorable for the development of the severe weather. The Storm Prediction Center will usually issue these watches well before the storms arrive, and it will likely be in effect for a couple of hours and generally cover a larger area. This is the time you should be watching. When there's a watch, you should be watching and paying attention to the changing weather conditions. That's very good info, Cass. And a warning is issued when severe weather is imminent or occurring. This is when you take action and quickly move to your safe place, as mentioned before. Yep, do not pass go, do not phone a friend, <laughs> just go to your safe place and wait there until that storm passes. That's right. And make sure you have multiple ways to receive those watches and warnings when they are issued. Speaking of which, the NOAA weather radios can be purchased online in some stores, and they are a great option when we have storms coming in after dark because they will alert you and wake you up. That's right. The emergency alert system is loud as well, and it will be running at the bottom of the screen when we are on and during a severe weather and the wireless emergency alerts will go off on your cell phones when the warning has been issued by the National Weather Service. They issue them. We do not just make <laughs> sure that you have those alerts turned on under your settings. So go to your cell phones, go to your settings and make sure you turn them on. It's super important this time of year. Yeah, very good. And speaking of rece receiving alerts to your phone, a great way to do that is by downloading the WBIR app. It provides an easy way to check the radar, receive weather notifications, and it's free. That's good news. You can also watch our live streaming coverage whenever we are on air during severe weather, which is a good way for you to receive important information once you have moved into your safe place. And another thing we have to talk about are outdoor sirens. Yeah. We've all seen the movies where the tornado sirens begin to wail as the skies darken and the winds start to pick up. And in some parts of East Tennessee, that scenario can happen. However, most towns in our viewing area actually don't have tornado sirens. Right. And the ones that do won't work if the power goes out. So it seems like you should expect to hear that sound when the weather gets rough, but make sure that you have other ways to receive those alerts as those sirens can either be unreliable or may not actually exist in your town. Yeah. In an effort to help give you a better heads up when severe weather could affect our area, we will be introducing 10 weather impact days to our forecasts. All right, so whenever you see this logo on the seven day forecast or on any of our weather graphics on the top left hand side of the screen, it means that impactful weather is expected. You want to check back often for updates to the forecast as we get closer to that time frame. We'll also continue to share details leading up to and during the event on our Facebook and Twitter pages where you can we can answer your questions and provide additional information. And in addition to the WBIR app, TV newscasts and social media, you can also find the very latest updates to that forecast on WBIR.com. Basically, you can reach us just about anywhere. Great job, guys. Pretty yeah. much covers it. Thank you for watching 10 News at 5. 10 News at 6 is coming up next.